Hey, it's Lou, and here's the thing. Publishers have long been the most powerful people in media, particularly news media. Traditionally, they've employed teams of gatekeepers to decide what content gets made and who gets the most prominence in cultural discourse. Want to publish an article in a newspaper? An editor has to approve it. Want to sound off on cable news? A producer has to invite you. But the internet promised to upend that model, down with the gatekeepers, forget about professional standards cooked up by elites in corner offices of newsrooms. Anyone, anywhere can use an internet connection to share their ideas, to be unfiltered. This new paradigm, techno optimists claimed, would be more inclusive and more diverse. We were headed toward a free speech utopia. Alas, it did not turn out that way. Social media platforms have been riddled with conspiracy theories, abusive hate speech, and propaganda that has impacted elections. YouTube, in particular, has struggled to manage dangerous and duplicitous content. Investigations have shown the site's algorithm often pushes users to extremist videos. So, why does YouTube lead us towards outrage, anger, and demonstrably false news? Is it time to rewrite the laws that govern content moderation at tech companies? And are the free speech principles embodied in the First Amendment outdated? The answer to bad speech is good speech. Don't censor the idiotic, dangerous, or misleading. Compete against it. Where there are falsehoods, speak truth. Where there is hate, speak love. Have faith that the best, most honest argument will win at the end of the day. Such is the essence of the marketplace of ideas, a concept closely associated with both the First Amendment and Silicon Valley's general approach to content moderation. In fact, a YouTube spokesperson told me while the site does have community standards that prohibit certain behavior, freedom of speech is at the foundation of YouTube and the company has a strong bias toward allowing content even when people express controversial or offensive views. Now, this permissive approach to speech is so ingrained in American culture that it's rarely examined. However, Philip Napoli, a professor of public policy at Duke University, reminded me that the First Amendment was written about 230 years ago, and perhaps some of it needs to be reimagined. Napoli alluded to a popular critique of the Second Amendment, which covers the right to bear arms. Gun control advocates argue that the Second Amendment can't possibly be relevant today because the musket-era founders couldn't anticipate the prevalence of automatic weapons. Likewise, Napoli told me, the founders couldn't fathom how the internet and social media would impact public discourse. Much more on that in a minute, but it's worth noting before we proceed that the First Amendment only applies to government censorship of speech, so YouTube or any other private company are well within their legal rights to block, promote, or delete whatever they want to. In addition, Kate Klonick, an assistant professor at St. John's University Law School, told me that Section 230 of 1996 Communication Decency Act, widely considered the most important law governing free speech on the internet, gives online intermediaries like YouTube, Facebook, and Yelp broad immunity when it comes to posting or refusing to post user-generated content. With that broad immunity, she continued, the architects of these sites are able to choose what values they want to protect if they want to protect any values at all. Klonick, who interviewed several of the key decision makers at Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube for a Harvard Law Review article, found that the primary reason these sites take down obscene and violent material is public relations. Klonick told me that no single video makes YouTube enough money to make a meaningful impact on the bottom line, and that the company isn't concerned with money per se. Rather, they're worried that if a decision to censor or promote something is out of sync with cultural norms, users might flock elsewhere. This is a tricky balancing act. If there are too many bullies, that might turn people off. But on the other hand, if there's excessive catering to sensitivities, that might also cause users to exodus in mass. Although, it's not exactly clear where they would go. Another reputational threat, Klonick added, might come from lawmakers. Senator Josh Hawley, peeved by perceived bias against conservatives, has proposed legislation that threatens Section 230 and the immunity it grants. Okay, that's some of the legal background associated with content moderation on sites like YouTube. But what about the marketplace of ideas principle as it plays out in modern internet culture? Is there such a thing as too much free speech? And is YouTube polluting the marketplace of ideas, to borrow a phrase from Napoli? 
Well, the empirical academic evidence does not look good for YouTube. I can point you to studies demonstrating that YouTube hosts misinformation about the Holocaust, vaccinations, 9-11, Ebola, synthetic marijuana, cancer, anorexia, dental implants, food allergies, and premature ejaculation, just to name a few. Perhaps it's inevitable that such undesirable content finds its way into YouTube's ecosystem. After all, 500 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute. That works out to be over 82 years worth of content posted to the site every single day. When you consider that mind-boggling number, it's easy to sympathize with YouTube's inability to weed out all the garbage. After all, they are making an effort. In just the first quarter of 2019, a YouTube spokesperson told me, YouTube removed 8.3 million videos for violating community guidelines. The majority of those videos, the spokesperson added, were removed before they received a single view. In addition, YouTube told me they have been investing in the policies, resources, and products needed to protect the YouTube community from harmful content going forward. But in the past, Independent investigations have found that YouTube's recommendation algorithm, an algorithm crafted by YouTube's computer scientists, mind you, is at least partially responsible for the popularity of false, phony, and malicious videos. In 2018, for instance, a Wall Street Journal investigation found, quote, YouTube's recommendations often lead users to channels that feature conspiracy theories, partisan viewpoints, and misleading videos even when those users haven't shown interest in such content. Likewise, sociologist Zeynep Tufeci, in a 2018 opinion piece for the New York Times titled YouTube, The Great Radicalizer, writes that YouTube, quote, promotes, recommends, and disseminates videos in a manner that appears to constantly up the stakes. If you search for jogging, Tufeci found, the algorithm will eventually lead you to videos about ultramarathoning. Vegetarianism leads to veganism. Searches about mainstream politicians lead to fringe groups and conspiracy theories. It seems as if you are never hardcore enough for YouTube's recommendation algorithm, Tufeche concluded. YouTube told me that the year-old Wall Street Journal and New York Times pieces I just cited are outdated. The company said that starting in January 2019, they launched changes to the recommendation system to limit the spread of harmful misinformation and borderline content. These changes, according to YouTube, were launched in the US and have already reduced recommendations of this type of content by 50%. YouTube said they also updated their approach towards hateful content in consultation with dozens of experts in subjects like violent extremism, supremacism, civil rights, and free speech. However, Paul Barrett, deputy director of NYU Stern's Center for Business and Human Rights, told me that YouTube's preference for increasingly extreme content is a feature of the system, not a bug. He told me YouTube is in the advertising business, so they have a financial incentive to keep users engaged. And YouTube, Barrett explained, knows that viewers are drawn to sensationalist negative material. Stefan Lewandowski, a professor of cognitive psychology at the University of Bristol, underscored this point. He told me conspiracy theories are comforting when you're troubled or confused by the truth. People crave easily identifiable enemies as opposed to random bad luck or big existential threats like climate change. In addition, Lewandowski told me that outrage is paradoxically an appealing emotion. That's why people are drawn to clickbait. He pointed me to data that false news stories are more likely to be shared and are likely to spread faster and farther than legitimate news stories. This gets at a key difference between free speech in the pre-internet era and free speech today. Barrett told me the old school gatekeepers, the editors, journalists, and lawyers in newsrooms help consumers tell the difference between fact and fiction. That's what journalists are trained to do. They make deliberate decisions about who's trusted with a cultural megaphone, who gets a platform. But content moderators at YouTube, given the sheer size of their challenge, can't possibly bring the same level of professional scrutiny. No wonder then that there's a mountain of so-called information on YouTube that's not fact-checked or scrutinized by experts. Hence, the rise of dangerous ideas like the anti-vaccination movement or flat-out lies about politicians that can potentially impact election results. 
That's why Barrett calls for YouTube to develop relationships with professional fact-checking organizations. He told me that fact-checking won't catch every little bit of misinformation, but fact-checkers can be particularly helpful when there's a breaking news situation and a lot of bad info circulates around the site. Napoli told me this whole situation is extremely ironic. The internet, he said, was supposed to make understanding things easier than ever before. World-class journalism, research, and analysis are just a click away. But because there's so much content in the internet age, it's getting harder and harder to tell what's real and what's fake. Napoli added that bona fide journalism and irresponsible fear-mongering often look alike on YouTube. We discussed the look and feel of this show. An unkempt dude, no makeup, no suit and tie, no brightly lit studio. Aesthetically, it doesn't have much in common with traditional journalism, although we strive to meet rigorous editorial standards. The point is, knowing who to trust on YouTube becomes a really big challenge since the visual signals of who's a professional and who's not have gotten pretty jumbled. I wholeheartedly agreed with Napoli, but I also wondered if there was something elitist about a Duke professor and a journalist on CNN's payroll complaining about all the untrained voices now in the public sphere. Napoli told me that there were problems with the old gatekeeper model. It lacked diversity for starters, but he told me, the idea that anyone with an internet connection is a journalist devalues and deprofessionalizes the process of news gathering and analysis. He added that American discourse has suffered from a recent anti-expert streak. It's allowed a bunch of speculative noise to drown out credible research. I get his point, but I also understand that mainstream media has many shortcomings that have contributed to the hunger for this alternative model. Shoddy reporting existed long before the internet. Some of the oldest publications frequently engage in clickbait. Minority perspectives were often overlooked. But the problem with this internet age alternative model, as I've discussed at length, is that it's flooded with the type of content that's bad for society. Content that confuses voters or uselessly stokes the fear and anger of citizens. Worse, that content creeps into our lives even when we don't seek it out. As Larissa Litsky, the dean of the University of Missouri School of Law writes, quote, if the majority of citizens make policy choices based on lies, half-truths, or propaganda, sovereignty lies not with the people, but with the purveyors of disinformation. If this is the case, democracy is both impossible and undesirable. In other words, the stakes are high. Society, government, even health are on the line. Look, the solution to this problem isn't readily apparent, but it's something we need to sort out as the internet matures. Companies like YouTube seem to be making up their rules on the fly, adjusting here and there to the latest controversies. Such is the frenetic pace of digital media. I get it. But prioritizing growth and engagement has brought great profits to YouTube. In the process, they've poisoned public discourse. And yes, free expression is an ideal worth preserving. But what good is the marketplace of ideas if it's overcrowded with junk, with counterfeits and knockoffs? The folks who control that market ought to do a better job curating it. They clearly have the money to do so, but do they have the will? Okay, I'm gonna go live my life.